You're listening to the Monday Night Community Show with Daniel on BRFM. We're talking all about a roof over their heads project and uh, now we're going to hear some uh, readings from the group and we're going to hear firstly from uh, James. Right, OK. Well, my story begins in 1941 and a stray bomb that dropped on a house in Sheerness. It is told through the eyes of a young girl and it's a core story of a much longer piece entitled Tales of Marine Parade that give glimpses of a family history from 1895 to the present day. And I call it The Orphan. This was Marine Parade in 1941. And I remember the night we went down to the shelter early. The whole family hurrying downstairs, grabbing the horrible black masks that made us all look like angry moles. Mum's footsteps on the stairs and Grandma and Grandad complaining. Aunt Lucy calling out and Aunt Mary trying to quieten the twins. And me yelling at Alfie to come on. There was pandemonium. The orphan running out of his room, clattering down the stairs, all added to the furious panic. Dad yelling, one each, one each. And me grabbing Alfie's mask as we passed. Puddles scuttled out the back door, spitting. His yellow eyes wide and teeth showing white in the dark. Hurry up, Dad yelled giving me a whack as I dawdled along, looking up at the sky. Move your bum, Sally. I hurried in front of him. Inside the shelter, was the oil lamp was alight. Alfie was with Mum, the aunts and the twins on the bunks, and Grandpa and Grandma in the far corner. The orphan was scrunched up, looking terrified. Puddles hurried past and jumped up on his lap. Alfie, who was six, and me, reckoned the orphan was a sissy, jumping nervously at every noise and at night he lay in his bed and whimpered, which, for a boy of twelve, three years older than me, didn't seem right. Dad heard me telling Alfie and collared me and explained it to me, the way adults do when they want you to behave. Don't call him that. He's my mate Joe's boy. He lost his parents and his sister, and we took him in because he's an orphan. I want you to treat him like an older brother, all right? I grunted, meaning, not likely, and Dad got stern and looked at me hard and said, he will be like an older brother, all right, Sally? Okay, he's my older brother, I mumbled. Come on, Sally, he's been through a lot. Give him a chance. He'll be company for Elfie, Dad said, missing the point entirely. I was Elfie's company, but Dad was giving me a serious look, and smiling, I said, all right, he'd be like an older brother. He ruffled my hair, a thing I hate, saying, that's my baby. But to Alfie and me, he was the orphan. You can't bring in a big brother from some other family and expect us to like the idea. Dad didn't understand that it was Alfie and me. I was his big sister. I liked Alfie. He wasn't a crybaby, except when Dad whacked him for being a little tyke. And besides, he had a proper name. Alfred, after Alfred the Great. Simon was a sissy name. Anyway, In the shelter, the orphan sat scrunched up, cuddling the cat, flinching at every loud bang. Alfie looked at me and mouthed, orphan, and grinned. I grinned back, but Mum shot us a black look and we let let them tuck us in on the benches. The twins were asleep in their cot, the ugly gas-proof box discarded in the house, and we all settled down to sleep. When the sirens went for the all clear, we crawled out of the shelter and went back into the house and soon Alfie and me were in our room in bed asleep, too tired to peek out the blackout curtain. And suddenly, we woke up to an almighty bang and lots of noise. Mother ran into the room and Uncle Tom and Father appeared carrying lights. And we were rushed out of the house, still dressed in our pyjamas, with blankets wrapped around us. Once outside, sleepy and scared, I saw the house two doors down was burning and already I could hear in the distance the fire engine bell coming closer. Father and uncle told mum and the aunts to take us up the road to the Hamiltons in Shrimp Terrace, and so we moved off. The orphan was shaking and crying, and I could understand a little of what he felt, because I was shaking, and I heard Elfie crying as he clutched mother's hand. Oh, gasped the orphan, and suddenly, gathering up his blanket close to him, he dashed off running into a house, dodging past the firefighters, setting up the hoses. A man shouted, but the orphan ran past and was inside before anybody could stop him. Uncle Tom ran after him, but I didn't see any more because Mother hurried me on. We were sitting round a fire, warming ourselves when Uncle Tom came in with the orphan, who, 
in spite of the soot on his face and Uncle Tom's bad language, he called him a bit more than an idiot, was smiling and clutching something close to his chest under the blanket. The silly kid risked his life and Uncle Tom's words failed as with a plaintive meow, our cat's face poked out from its refuge. I, I couldn't leave puddles behind, the orphan said, staggering a little as he came closer to the fire. I looked at him and instead of a snivelling coward, I saw a tired but happy boy and reached out to stroke Puddle's head and I said, thank you, Simon. And if you can believe that's told by a little girl, you're all right. <laughs> when I first came to live on Sheppey in October 2008, I started to research the island's ecology and history. One of the many things I discovered was that a substance called copperas was processed here on quite a large scale in the 16th century and even up to the 19th century. Copperas was a very important commodity with many commercial uses, bringing wealth to England and in particular to Queenborough. I found a very short reference to a man named Matthias Falconer by historian William Lambard in his Perambulations of Kent, written in 1570. Falconer was a Dutch immigrant who started processing copperas at Queenborough. This is thought to be the earliest known reference to a chemical factory in Britain. Here's my imagining of his story. Gruner Vitriol. A reading from a letter locked in a small iron box which was dug from the trench during the archaeological excavation of Queenborough Castle in 2005. It was addressed to Anna Falconer, closed with the seal of Matthias Falconer. My dear Anna, before I am laid in my grave, I am compelled to write this letter to you as my dear wife. It has come to you sealed with instructions to be opened by you alone after my death. There's a dreadful ache in the sinews in my old hands which makes this all the harder to write. But I must try to set things right by you before it is too late. I know that you have always shared with me a deep love of the flat heathlands around the home that we built together back in Brabant, in our Dutch motherland, in the year 1545. You were my companion and help through the years I spent learning my trade as an alchemical engineer, working with what to you was the accursed copper ass. In truth, I wished only to give the best support I could to our little family but you know it became impossible for us to worship as our consciences saw fit because the Spaniards still ruled North Brabant. Oh, Anna, I remember you fondly as a young woman of 20, dressed all in white and pink for our wedding day. What a joyous day that was. And do you remember that Christmas time when we visited your cousins in Antwerp? The goose was so fat we thought it would not be cooked in time for the festive meal. The trees were all dressed in white and the bells were ringing out when we took our little Pieta to Bogganing for the first time after morning church. How he loved it. Reluctant as you were, but brave woman that you are, you took a turn on the sled and how you laughed when you fell into that snowdrift and came out looking like a snow woman with your bright red nose. Ah, oh, yes, we had some happiness in our years together, and I was reluctant to take you on our beloved Pieta, who was then but seven years old, to England, against your wishes, but I felt it was for the best. I believed it would give us freedom from religious persecution and give us the chance to build a better quality of life. And it did give us those things, did it not, Anna? Think what a guileful act the Pope decreed to make Antwerp the only place where copper ass could be bought. Ha! Those papists sewed up the market tight as a duck's. So in the year of 65, 
when the sovereign lady Queen Elizabeth of England offered up monopolies to certain Dutch mineral men, I had to take the chance to come to England. I am proud to be one of those few men charged by the English crown with the task of seeking places which yielded the stones to make copper us. Aye, that was the same year that the Spaniards sent their armada against the English fleet and were defeated by the clever strategies of Drake and our Queen. I won't forget what a time of unease and triumph that was. Stalwart fishermen from Queenborough, Laysdown and Minster were called to sail with Drake for their country in eleven small ships. Such a time. Ah, but I'm getting ahead of myself. So it was that in 73 I fetched up with you and Pieter at Queenborough on the Isles of Sheppey and we were furnished with very serviceable quarters at the castle. I'd found that copper ass stones were indeed plentiful on the Minster and Warden shores. Those heavy, knobbly, dull grey pebbles full of iron. Only when they're broken open and exposed to the air and seawater do you see their true essence. Pale green globules, like fish eggs, lie on the cut grey-green surface which shines like metal. Your nostrils pick up the faint but unwholesome bad egg smell of brimstone. Pugh! And it has a nauseous taste. You didn't know what copper ass was at that time. And God knows you always hated it after. But I still think... It is almost a magical substance. <laughs>